Uh, this is Richard Mendelson. Richard Mendelson is an internationally recognized wine lawyer with Dickinson, Peatman, and Fogarty in Napa. He also directs the Wine Law and Policy Program at UC Berkeley Law School, and he is the sole proprietor of Mendelssohn Wines uh, that produces a Pinot Noir and fortified dessert wines. Uh, he's a graduate of Harvard, Oxford, and Stanford Law. He is the author of From Demon to Darling, A Legal History of Wine in America, Wine in America Law and Policy in Appalachian Napa Valley, Building and Protecting an American Treasure. So without further ado, please take us away into the Appalachian world. Thanks, Chris, and thank you, Blake. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Welcome to my home in Napa. Um, I've been asked uh, to set the stage for our discussions today by giving you um, kind of a tour de force of um, Appalachians and geographical indications around the world and how we get to the point we are today of crafting our cannabis Appalachians and what the background to that is. So I'm gonna divide my remarks uh, into the following um, uh, sections. If you could move the slide to the to the next one, please, uh, Chris. Um, first, I'm going to talk about the road to GIs. GIs, we're going to be using a lot of acronyms here. GI stands for Geographical uh, Indications. And it started with the Paris Convention. This is an international perspective all the way forward to TRIPS, which is the trade-related aspects of intellectual property rights. It's an agreement, as we'll see, that was adopted by the World Trade Organization. And this will um, tell us what Appalachians and geographical indications are and the issues that uh, we've been trying to deal with both nationally and internationally. Then we're going to move roughly equal time sec uh, segments for each of these sections uh, to wine Appalachians in both the old world and the new world, because really, um, it's while by no means our wine is wine the only commodity for which Appalachians apply. Uh, it's prim primarily the the focal point because it's of such long standing, particularly in the old world, uh, that we have a lot of lessons to learn. And of course, we have the experience in the United States and other New World countries of uh, our American viticultural areas, which is the third bullet here, AVAs, and. I'm going to tell you basically what the experience has been uh, with AVAs uh, in our country, what we've learned, what we've created, uh, what the regulations say. Um, this is an area in which I've participated actively throughout my career in, in actually forming AVAs uh, in California and elsewhere. Uh, I want to um, spend a little bit of time talking about what I regard as a very important subject, conflicts between geographic trademarks, that is a mark that includes a geographic term, and GIs, which primarily are geographic terms. Sometimes they appear in both, both a geographic mark and in a GI, and there can be conflicts between them. I know we have a session later in the webinar on that specific topic, and so all I want to do is introduce the points, uh, and then I'm going to leave time for, for Q&A. So that's the roadmap. Let's start. Section one, the road to GIs. It started in 1883 with the Paris Convention for the Protection of Industrial Property. This is an era in which rapid industrialization was occurring around the world. And this is really the first legal agreement that deals with, uh, they use the terms indications of source and appellations of origin, but that agreement didn't define either of those terms. That came in later agreements. Um, and you'll see down at the bottom that there are 177 contracting parties to the Paris Convention, including the United States. It's a very, it's an agreement that that was broadly um, uh, adopted around the world. Now, the important thing about the Paris uh, Convention is that it only addressed false indications and not misleading indications. So, um, for example, the agreement at large did deal with both false and misleading, but not with respect to origin. So uh, Article 10B of, of the agreement is the provision that says that um, not only would it be prohibited to use a false indication of source or appellation of origin, for example, if I said uh, on a wine that it's Napa Valley, and in fact, the wine, none of the grapes come from the Napa Valley, that's false. 
but it also um, the agreement wanted to get at misleading or deceptive uses of those names and that can take many forms um, it can take the form of just saying that this is like napa valley or uh, similar to or napa valley type um, that would be one indication where it's not really from there and you're, you're but it, it could be misleading um, or variations in spelling so you'll see that the agreement um, prohibited not only false um, uh, indications, but also those that were liable to mislead the public as to the nature, the manufacturing process, the characteristics, the suitability for purpose, or the qu quantity of the goods. Interestingly, it doesn't say origin. Origin was in an earlier draft of the agreement, but it was pulled out because there's always been a controversy about um, uh, the use of generic terms, which we'll talk about in a minute, and other kind of indicators to tell someone that a wine is, for example, like a Bordeaux, even though it's not a Bordeaux wine. Let's go to the next slide. So the next agreement in um, this litany um, is the Lisbon Agreement. Um, I don't know why the heading, ooh, this is very garbled. I'm not exact, looks like we, there we go. Thank you, Chris. The Lisbon Agreement, we roll forward all the way to 1958, but it's a very important agreement um, because it, uh, for the first time, defines an appellation of origin, and you'll see that in the first bullet. It's a geographical denomination of a country, region, or locality designating a product originating therein, and these are the important words, the quality or char characteristics of which are due exclusively or essentially to the geographic environment, including natural and human factors. This is the causal link that we talk about between product and place, that, that it's not just that a product is manufactured in a place or even um, that the, the raw materials come from that place. Basically, the final product, whether it's an agricultural crop, a handy, handicraft, uh, textile, whatever it is, whatever kind of appellation system we're talking about, the quality or characteristics of that final product are tied directly to the geographic environment. So in the case of an agricultural crop, that's actually where the crop is grown, which we refer to as terroir, all of the aspects of the natural environment. But it also includes the human factors. And by that, I mean how you farm that land. What is your planting density? What's your rootstock? What's your, um, what's your trellis system? How do you make the wine and the winery? all of those human factors that result in this final product. So finally, in 1958, we have a definition of appellation of origin. Um, we also have a registry uh, maintained by WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Organization in Geneva, where you can let the world know that you as a contracting state of the Lisbon Agreement have um, recognized an appellation of origin in your state, and you'd like the, all the other contracting states to abide by it. And so they are given notice by WIPO, and within a year, they, they have the right um, to refuse protection, but they have to state why. Um, and, and those can be that, for example, that a wine name um, was in use in that country for a very long time, without having an indication of, without being an indication of origin. So there was a pre-existing use of that name. There are other reasons why a name may be refused of protection. Interestingly, the Lisbon Agreement um, covers not only false uses, but also any usurpation or imitation, even when used in translation or accompanied by words such as kind, type, or like. And once it's, uh, a name is protected, it cannot fall into genericide. It cannot become a generic name once it's protected in the, in the contracting state. So this goes much, much farther than the Paris Convention in protecting against false indications, protecting against misleading indications, and also defining in a very direct way the link between the product and place in order to qualify as an appellation of origin. Now the downside, Chris, if you go to the next slide, is that there were very few contracting parties and you'll see that they were mostly in Europe. There are Canada, the United States, et cetera, Australia, 
uh, they did not join. Uh, even when there was a um, uh, an amendment to uh, the Lisbon Agreement, which took place in 2015, the Geneva Act, because the Lisbon Agreement was seeking, and WIPO was seeking to make the, this um, this treaty, this agreement, um, more widespread, so that they amended it in 2015 to cover not only Appalachians of origin, but also um, uh, also excuse me, good reason to turn off your uh, cell phone. Sorry about that. Um, also, they covered the registration of GIs, which is the agreement that we're going to turn to next. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is the World Trade Organization Agreement on uh, Trade-Related Aspects of Intellectual Property Rights, TRIPS Agreement, 1995. And for the first time, we have a definition of geographical indication, a GI. But what you're going to see here is that GIs are a, a more liberal, a looser definition than an appellation of origin. Or to put it another way, appellations of origin are a subset of GIs. A GI, according to Article 22 of the TRIPS Agreement, identifies a good as originating in the territory of a member, a region, or a locality. That's identical to the appellation of origin definition so far, except for the bold-faced language, where a given quality, reputation, for the first time we see the word reputation, or other characteristic of the good is essentially, not exclusively, essentially attributable to its geographical uh, origin. There are 164 member states that signed this agreement, including the United States. So it, like the Paris Convention, it's uh, um, a widespread approval around the world. And in fact, in Article 23, there is a protection that is more elevated than for any other goods and services for wines and spirits. Specifically, like the Lisbon Agreement, the, the GIs are protected against false and misleading deceptive uses, whereas all the other goods that are GIs that aren't wines and spirits are not protected against misleading and deceptive uses, but only false uses. So this is important. Um, Article 24 contains exceptions. Uh, we have exceptions for geographic trademarks, which we'll talk about later for generic names, where a name has been used in a country for a very long time. Uh, for example, a lot of the cheeses in America, like feta and Parmesan, that really don't come from their original sources. Um, what's important to know about the uh, TRIPS agreement is it's a minimum standards agreement, meaning that member states have the right to put in place stricter rules governing GIs. Um, some have their own GI systems. We call those sui generis systems. Others, as we'll see in the next slide, um, uh, will use their trademark laws to recognize GIs. The last point about the TRIPS agreement is that there is no multilateral register where you can look to, as you can at WIPO for the Lisbon Agreement, and see the list of GIs around the world. Next slide, please. Here are examples, photographic examples. If you click one more time, Chris, I think some more will come up. Um, names that you all know, Parmesan cheese, Parmigiano Reggiano in its translation to Parmesan, uh, Darjeeling tea, Parma ham, Indian River, navel oranges from where I'm from in Napa, Kona coffee, which is a story unto itself, and even things like traditional knowledge uh, on the bottom left, Ayurved, uh, uh, system of health, um, in, in India. Let's go to the next slide. I was mentioning the U.S. protects GIs through um, the existing trademark clause and does not have a sui generis GI system as, the, as occurs in um, the European Union and other countries. We use certification and collective marks, and I've just listed some of the certification marks and the registration numbers in the U.S. to give you an indication of this. Parma ham, Darjeeling, Jamaica Blue Mountain coffee, Vidalia for onions coming from Georgia, Parmigiano Reggiano, and Roquefort. And here I give the definition if you were to look this up on the PTO, Patent and Trademark Office uh, site, you'd see that Roquefort is a cheese. It's been manufactured from sheep's milk, cured in the caves of the community of Roquefort in accordance with long-established methods and processes. 
these methods and processes are the natural, are, are the human factors that go along with the fact that the sheep's milk and the caves are inside of the area of the Roquefort um, Appalachian. And, and these are protected in the US as a certification mark. Okay, what are the differences then between GIs and Appalachians of origin? Just in summary, GIs require a link between the quality, other characteristics or reputation of the product and its place of origin. Appalachians of origin require a stricter link, namely that the product's quality or characteristics are due exclusively or essentially to the product's geographical origin. This means that the usually means doesn't every country will set up their own rules, but typically it means that the raw materials are sourced in the place of origin and that the processing of the product takes place there. Now, on the bottom of this slide are the seals. I know we're going to talk about seals, I think, in the next uh, session um, for the PDOs, which are the um, of the Appalachians of origin for the PGIs, which are the GIs, the ge geographical indications, and then they also have traditional specialty products. These are the three seals that are used in the European Union to differentiate. That is, the European Union doesn't just pick one. It's not just that every product in the European Union is an Appalachian of origin. Some are PGIs and some are traditional specialties. So you don't have to choose one or the other. Next slide. Chris, yeah, thank you. One important thing to note uh, about Appalachians of origin and GIs, or any GI, we'll, we'll call Appalachians of origin a subset of GIs, is that there is an ongoing tension between tradition and innovation in these GI products. You know, an Appalachian of origin for a product that's been around for a very long time has history and tradition to encapsulate in the uh, production methodology and all the, well, what we call in our uh, cannabis Appalachian regulation standards, practices, and cultivars. Um, and, and so there is tradition to respect. But there's also innovation that's important for any uh, GI because a GI can die. Um, and there are lots of examples of, of, of deceased GIs because they didn't keep up with the times, methods, the consumer demands. Um, so we find tension. Uh, I gave two examples here below. We won't spend any time on them because I'm going to move quickly. Uh, but Masta de Mascasac in the Languedoc region of, of, of France and Tignanello, which is an Antonori wine, one of the most famous Super Tuscans. Both of these um, wines uh, and their wine proprietors were innovators, and they didn't like being bound by the Appalachian of origin uh, controls. And in order to innovate, they literally had to sell their wines as table wines, and they broke out of the AO system. In fact, it was the AOC and the DOCG systems um, in their respective countries in order to do their own thing, to try to show that their innovation would make a better product, a higher quality, with even better characteristics, more recognizable and distinctive characteristics. Interestingly, um, they were both successful. And what happens is then the Appalachian authorities recognize that and change the rules. So this is not a static process, it's a dynamic process. Next slide, please. Okay, but let's turn to wine now. Um, and if you click through all of these bullets, uh, Chris, um, uh, you'll see the bottom one is typicite and you'll know you're done. Um, I wanted to start with the controlled appellations of the old world. This is the Appellation d'origine controlé, meaning control, or DOC, Denominazione d'origine controllata, controlled. What does it mean to be a controlled appellation? What it really means is that you are, in essence, a, an appellation of origin and not a GI, because you are doing, you're, you're getting into the issues of standards, practices, and, and cultivars in a way that typically a GI does not. So in the old world, and I show the example of Latash, which is one of the most famous Burgundy wines, um, and it's uh, an AOC, um, you, the grapes have to be totally grown within the Appalachian. Only permissible grape varietals can be grown. You can grow anything you want, 
in, in that area, but you just can't use the AOC. You can't call yourself Latash if you're not using Pinot Noir grapes. If you want to grow Cabernet there, you'll be a, a rebel uh, and you can sell your wine as a table wine. Um, and then there are a host of, um, uh, of other criteria, both in farming and in winemaking that you need to follow. I've given some examples here, the yield of grapes, minimum and maximum alcohol percentage, but it's actually much broader than that. This is called a cahier de charge is what the French call it. And it's really your, it's not a recipe, it's a range of parameters so that you can still as a wine proprietor practice your artistry and produce a unique product, but you have to stay within these given ranges. And then ultimately you have to pass a chemical analysis and a typicity test, literally, where a judge tastes the product and says, is this typical of a Latash wine? Um, given all the vintage variations and everything else that, 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 that can uh, cause variations, but if it's not um, typical, then it can be thrown out and, and it's not allowed to use the AOC on the label. Next. In the United States, um, we didn't really have much of a concept of provenance coming out of the ashes of prohibition in 1933 and trying to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps largely through innovation and technical um, expertise. Um, it really wasn't until the Paris tasting of 1976 when um, some actually Napa Valley wines bested the wines of France that people started to use on a more routine basis. Um, geographical indications, appellations of origin on their label, but nobody knew where they were. They weren't regulated. So here are two examples, the Louis Martini California Mountain Cabernet Sauvignon. I'm sure you all know where California Mountain is. Well, it's wherever you think it is. There's no such thing. And Northern California, well, all of us Californians can tell you we, well, there is no real definition of Northern California and people have their own views. As a result, if you go to the next slide, Chris, we ended up adopting a system, an appellation system in the late 70s. It took effect in 1983, where we have for our appellations for wine, uh, you can use the United States, a state or a county. Um, those are political appellations. Of course, those boundaries pre-existed. We all know where they are. But the new invention was this concept of an Appalachian or an American Viticultural Area, an AVA, uh, that would gonna be created uh, and established by the federal government. This is not at the state level, it's the Treasury Department and the uh, Tax and Trade Bureau, um, Alcohol and Tobacco Tax and Trade Bureau that, does, that runs this program, but AVAs would be created anew. Um, and uh, in, for each, of these appellations, because American viticultural areas are a form of appellation under the American system, um, you would have to have a certain percentage of your grapes from that area in the, in the wine. But it did not control, and it does not control, which variety of grapes you use, uh, your yields, your farming methods, uh, your winemaking practices, only where the um, grapes come from and where the wine is made. And so if you use an AVA on the label, the wine must be made in the state in which the AVA is located. Uh, that's important. And in order to form an AVA, well, you, let's go to the next slide. Uh, we'll get into how you form an AVA in a minute. Here's the definition, defined as a delimited grape growing region, distinguishable by geographic features. Interestingly, those are the same words that we find in our proposed cannabis regulations, the boundaries of which have been recognized and defined by TTB. Here are two examples down below, the Ohio River Valley on the right, Finger Lakes in New York on the left, uh, appearing on the label in direct conjunction with the grape varietal, the Viognier and Roussan on the right and the Pinot Noir on the left. Let's go to the next slide. So just to, uh, and one more click, please. Um, uh, just to show you uh, examples, let's take the Hagathan label. That's a Napa Valley wine. Uh, the fact that it says Napa Valley means that 85% of the grapes uh, are grown in the Napa Valley. 
the fact that there's a vineyard designation, Heston Vineyard increases that percentage to 95. And in fact, there's even more information on the label, which you're allowed to use uh, the L block of that particular vineyard, for example. Next slide. So far, we have formed 245 AVAs in the 32 states of, of the United States. Uh, I'm, you're not supposed to read all that small type, but this is right out of the, of, of the uh, Code of Federal um, Regulations. Go to the next slide. Here is how you form an AVA. First, you must show, and, and this is anyone can do this. It could be one person, it could be uh, someone who's not in the wine industry at all, doesn't grow grapes and doesn't make wine. Anyone can file an AVA petition with TTB. Whoever files that petition, whether it, usually it's a group of vintners and growers together filing it, you must adduce name evidence that um, currently and directly associates the name with the area in which viticulture exists. So there has to be some grape growing there. All of the area within the boundaries must be nationally or locally known by the name specified in the petition, although the use of that name may extend beyond the proposed AVA boundary. So you can have names that are over-inclusive, you can't have names that are under-inclusive, and they must, uh, remember this is a, all done, all of these regulations for wine in the United States are under the Federal Alcohol Administration Act, which is in part a consumer protection, a consumer information act, and this is to give the consumer information to guide their purchasing decisions. There's boundaries, obviously, uh, and they tell you, if you'll see down in four below, those are based on characteristics seen on United States geological survey maps. Those are topographic maps. So most boundaries are done based on elevation contours that show on those maps, rivers and roads, mountaintops um, and the like. Not like in France where we actually use parcel lines, the lines of your property to define an appellation. And then the most important point in my, from my perspective is distinguishing viticultural features, climate, soil, geology, physical features and elevation. The petition must explain with specificity in what way these features affect viticulture and how they are distinguished viticulturally from features associated with adjacent areas outside the boundary. It's so funny, many of these um, criteria um, reappear in our proposed um, cannabis appellation regulations. Next slide. We have had over the course of what is from 1983 to today, so that's 37 years, um, we've had um, uh, the process of, of actually subdividing appellations. We call them nested AVAs or sub-AVAs, where, for example, on the left there, you'll see that Napa Valley in that lighter tan tone has been subdivided into many other smaller area AVAs that capture more distinctive uh, uh, geographical features, more distinctive grape growing environments. Uh, within the Napa Valley. Similarly, it's happened in the Willamette Valley, as you'll see on the right, in Lodi, in Paso Robles, and many other places. This is around the world a very common thing, whether it's coffee or tea or whatever the commodity is, to, to have nested AVAs, larger down to smaller, and then the consumer can play the I call it the Appalachian name, name game. If I want to know about Napa Valley, that's one thing. If I want to spend more money, because it usually is more money, and buy a Howell Mountain wine and explore those differences, I can do that. So it's a way of understanding for the consumer, better understanding the final product. Okay, next. Thanks, Chris. Yes, well, this point is just to, to reiterate what I said, certain appellations to command higher prices. This is important. This is the value add that comes through an appellation that isn't the, the owned by one individual farmer or winery. It's a collective of growers and vintners inside the appellation that collectively own this property. And in fact, when you put Napa Valley on a wine, compared to its uh, California wine, you're gonna spend $19.80 more on average, according to, this was a UC Davis uh, Ag Extension uh, study. 
And if you go and use Oakville or Howell Mountain, you'll be $40 plus more than that uh, California wine. So you're paying more. And the question I always ask in the classes I teach is, this is why we do tastings, is it worth it? Is it worth it to pay more for that Howell Mountain wine than a California wine? Well, only you, the consumer, will know. And hopefully the producer is producing something that has, to go back to the definition of appellations, that has characteristics and qualities that you can find and refine the next time you buy that wine and help guide your um, uh, education and purchases. Next slide. Well, quality, in fact is not a criteria of the AVA system because we don't have the standards practices and cultivars that are that are required to use an appellation name it's much more leaving it to the collective to experiment it's it's part of the american pride and in innovation um, rather than uh, well we don't have as long of a tradition particularly the traditions we had were interrupted by 13 years of prohibition Nevertheless, the successful appellations, of which I would certainly um, include the Napa Valley as, as one, if not the foremost, um, will do their own efforts at consumer education. They'll do the research. They'll do the promotion. They'll be interested in sustainability, whether it's social, environmental, or economic. Um, and, and this is um, important. Uh, to their uh, having loyal customers. So even though it may not be regulatory, it is aspirational and voluntary. And, and now a, a real effort on the part of ABAs that want to succeed in the marketplace. Next slide. Here are two examples, Coro Mendocino and Lodi rules, each of which take the form of a logo. These are certification marks, by the way. These are not, they are AOC style controls but on a label, they you will still find Lodi and you'll find Mendocino on the label as the appellation, but you'll find this logo that tells you what additional um, grape growing or winemaking rules um, that they have voluntarily adhered to in order to put this sticker on the label. So again, going back to this tradition and innovation, this is the ABAs that don't have the tradition seeking to have more AOC style controls, wanting to honor the traditions that are now being established in those areas. Next slide. Okay, um, we're just gonna take a few more minutes and then we're gonna leave ourselves open for questions. I'm gonna keep us on a, on a tight timeline, but I wanna talk for a minute about uh, the conflicts between geographic marks and GIs. This would be an example of where somebody comes into an area and they pick the name of their town or of a creek nearby and they may be unwitting that's the only they don't want to use their family name and they call their brand by a geographic name uh, and then later or maybe it's even before the appellation was established whether the appellation was established before the trademark or after can be is important as the third bullet there shows first in time first in right which is a common trademark principle. Um, but just as important, and number one for me, is the fact that nobody owns exclusively a geographic name. Nobody owns the Napa Valley. Nobody owns the name Humboldt. You may use it, and you have to use it descriptively, and that's called a fair use. Anyone can say, I live in the Napa Valley. I live in Humboldt County. I live in the Matoll Valley. Um, you don't want people to be misled. This is, I think, and then this goes back all the way to where we started with these international agreements. You know, you don't want people to be misled or deceived. So if a, a geographic mark, uh, just make it up, you know, um, well, I'll use it in, 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 the, in, in the cannabis world. Matoll uh, brand uh, is put on products that do not come from the Matoll Valley. Whether the Matoll Valley is, 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 is recognized uh, prior to that or after that, it misleads consumers. Um, as I said, with respect to the third bullet, typically uh, uh, most intellectual property lawyers uh, would say that this should be resolved in who registers first. If the trademark pre-existed the appellation, well, they get to continue. I, I'm not a believer in that. I think it's much more complicated than this. Um, and I believe in the rights of appellations 
Uh, I think it's a collective right and it's an important one. But sometimes the priority is legislated uh, as it is in the EU, which is much more, um, akin, much more akin to my views of, of giving priority to the appellation. Sometimes it turns on good or bad faith. Um, and I've got great stories here that I'm not able to tell you because I don't have the time, but let's go to the next slide, Chris, because I think this will set the stage perhaps for the later uh, session on um, intellectual property rights. These are the kinds of things that should be taken into consideration in determining how to resolve differences between trademarks and GIs. And by trademarks, I mean trademarks that include GI names the reputation of the region, the reputation of the mark, the length of time that the, either the trademark or the region has, that name has been out in the public. The extent to which the reputation of the trademark assisted in the development of the reputation of the region and vice versa, the value of the trademark and whether the, the trademark holder is likely to be prejudiced or would the appellation holder be prejudiced if one is given priority over the other. And you know from the proposed regulations that um, CDFA has proposed a, um, a three-year sunsetting period for anyone who has a trademark incorporating the name of a, of a, a GI. You have, would have three years to continue to use it after which you'd have to discontinue, pick a new brand name, unless, and this is an important exception, unless your wine or your cannabis or whatever the product is, is descriptive and does qualify for the appellation of origin name. So no one is putting a trademark holder out of business. They're just saying you must use that name. Maybe it's after three years, after a sunset period, you must use it descriptively and accurately. The last thing I'll say about this, and then we'll open it up to questions, is that we are at the beginning of the Appalachian program for cannabis. This is what excites me so much about it. I was at the beginning of the, of the American wine Appalachian system too. It's an exciting time. We have the chance to minimize right now the number of conflicts between geographic trademarks and Appalachians. For example, I would say anybody who after the proposed regulations were, were, were made public, who goes out and registers a geographic name that later becomes a GI, uh, they should not get the benefit of grandfathering. They're on notice that we will have a geographical indication system or an appellation of origin system for cannabis in California. So use geographic names at your, at your discretion, but also at your potential peril if they later become an appellation. So with that, um, I think I've kept to my time um, and I'd love to answer any questions that you have. Thank you so much. Um, that was a wealth of knowledge and I have to admit that uh, I have been flooded with text messages <laughs> telling us how, how valuable this has been so far. So I, I really, really appreciate that. Um, there's so much information there, it's almost hard to come up with sort of cohesive questions. But one of the things that you really hit on was that the purpose of the Appalachians from the consumer perspective is to be able to experiment, to be able to find and refine certain qualities of a product that you like, that you want to continue to experience. Um, in the U.S., you mentioned that the AVAs are primarily geographical, whereas in the EU, um, they sort of take into everything into account, right? They take in uh, the soil, the, the farming practices, sort of the human, uh, the human aspect of that. When you're talking about the ability to communicate to a consumer, sort of the, the region, um, how helpful is it to sort of include more of those factors rather than less? Like the U.S. system, it seems like that, just having the geographical indicator is the bare minimum. Um, how much more utility is there in an Appalachian system that has um, those higher identifiers that we saw in sort of like those Lodi brands that you brought up or, or the other ones there? Well, I think the, the answer to that, Chris, is in part, um, uh, uh, will a consumer, uh, once they know what an Appalachian product is, will it help them? Will they be willing to pay that extra price? Will they be willing to say, now I know what a Matol Valley cannabis is like? 
you know, I know it's these cultivars, it's grown with these standards and practices. I can rest assured when I buy the next one, even if it's somebody, some other cultivator, I'm going to find again those things. That is what will allow that customer to pay the additional dollars to invest in that region. Now, even in, with AVAs, even though we don't have that by legislation, the AVAs are doing it themselves. The Vintner Grower Groups inside the AVAs are seeking to bring that value add proposition, that education, that guarantee of certain characteristics or qualities to the consumers, and they're doing it through privatization, through voluntary certification marks and the like. So uh, in a sense, GIs and, and Appalachians end up you know, it's a dynamic, they go back and forth. Uh, ultimately, you're trying to uh, have loyal consumers. Absolutely. And and speaking of that sort of consumer question, this is actually a question from Rebecca Staney White, who's running our Business of Appalachians panel a little bit further down the road. Um, she's wondering, you know, is this a chicken or the egg problem? Is the sort of that that consumer investment in a particular reason what drives an Appalachian or is the uh, Appalachian itself and the producers that are coming up with these Appalachian what drives sort of that consumer interest? Do you have a feeling about that? Well, it's both, but it's the producers first and foremost. They're the ones who are going to pay for this to go through this process. They're the ones who know their product best. They're the ones who will know what the co collective, I mean, they're, they're, they're going to be the ones who collaborate on all the information that goes into a petition um, and and they want to express this to their consumers so i think it's the 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 not just the onus or the responsibility the desire really comes first and foremost in my estimation my experience from the producers but the consumers uh you know they're the bottom they're the they're the final uh, uh test this is why in my class, we taste every product. If you if you can't see the difference, if a, if an Appalachian's standards, practices, and and cultivars and everything that goes in it is meaningless, then your Appalachian will die on the vine. Sure. Yeah. If, if it if it doesn't have those characteristics that are recognizable for the rest of us, then then what good is it in the first place? I guess is the question. Correct. Um, thank you so much, Richard. Uh, we are unfortunately out of time for this first uh, very very introductory presentation. There's so much there. We're on our next panel.